Hey guys, today I'm gonna to be answering your makeup questions. I asked you over on my community tab to just ask me anything makeup related. And I selected some questions that had the most likes. So I'm guessing these are the questions that most of you want to hear the answers to. Um, so if I don't get to your question, I'm so sorry. I'm just trying to fit what I can into the length of this video and not make it too long, but I will be doing the style of video again. And I also have some others that I've done in the past. So I'll link them at the end. If you enjoy this video, then you could always check those out next because I might answer your question in some of those. So while I'm answering your questions, I thought I would just get ready and I'm just going to be using some of my favorite summer makeup of the moment that I've kind of been using on the daily. So let's go ahead and jump right in and get started. All right, so I'm gonna start with my brows. That's usually the step that I always start with. And the reason for that is because I usually apply a clear brow gel first and then I wanna let it dry. So I kind of move on to other things and then I go back later once my brows are dry and fill them in. Let's read the first question. This one is actually a really fun one. It says blushes that look boring in the pan, but beautiful on the face. By the way, this is the Too Faced Fluff and Hold Laminating Brow Wax. It is my favorite brow gel of the moment. Actually, it's all I've been using for probably like the past four to six months. I can't remember exactly when I got it. It was sometime, I think back around the holidays, but I love how much hold this has. And also inside of the cap, they give you a little double-sided brush. So once you apply it, then you can go back with the brush and just comb things out a little bit and get your brows to look exactly the way that you want. So anyway, question number one, blushes that look boring in the pan, but beautiful on the face. So I thought this was so interesting. I guess I've never really thought about it before, but there were a couple that came to mind immediately. The first one is CoverGirl Soft Mink. So this one, when I saw it in store, I wasn't initially drawn to it. I only purchased it because several of you guys told me that I should, but in the pan, it just looks like a basic everyday kind of pinky nude shade. I really wasn't expecting much out of it. But this color is so beautiful on the skin. When you go to like blend it out, it has this little bit of luminosity to it, not a ton of sparkle or glitter. It just adds the most beautiful subtle glow. And at the same time, the color just warms up your cheeks a little bit. It just gives that hint of color. It almost doesn't look like you're wearing blush, but it's just like your natural skin flushing. And it because it's more of a nude shade, it goes with absolutely everything. So I love that one. Another one that that totally shocked me. And you guys actually might remember this video. This was the e.l.f. Luminous Putty Blush. I did a whole video where I just tried on every single shade. And when I got to this one, Barbados, I really wasn't expecting to love it because it basically just looks like a brown or almost a coppery color blush in the pan. But on my cheeks, I was so wowed by this one because when it's sheared out, it has a little bit of like red or pink in it as well that gave me this sort of a sunburned kind of a look. It just reminded me of like when I'm at the beach all day or I'm outside and then I come home and my cheeks just have this beautiful flush that's a little bit tan and a little bit rosy. It is just the most beautiful color. So that one really shocked me. And then the third one that I could think of is ColourPop's Super Shock Blush in the shade Brute Flute. So this one kind of similar to Barbados, just in the pan, looks like a kind of brownish pinkish color, but again, kind of like the e.l.f. one, it goes on looking so rosy and so beautiful. And this also has that little bit of a glow. All three of these do, it's kind of funny, but it's not sparkly or glittery. It just gives your cheeks this really gorgeous, subtle sheen. And I think the color is just so unique. I don't have really any other blush that looks like this color. And again, it's like the perfect nude that goes with so many different looks. So I reach for that one all the time. Question number two was one that I actually got a few different times. The first one says, which categories do you think high end is worth the investment? And which categories do you think drugstore is just as good? Another one said, which category of makeup you won't buy high end? Which category is best to splurge or save? I would say blushes are a category that you can buy at the drugstore pretty safely. I don't notice a whole lot of difference between drugstore blushes and higher end formulas, unless of course there's a specific color that you like. 
Um, eyeliners and lip liners. I think it was Marlene Estelle who said that pretty much high-end and drugstore eyeliners and lip liners are all made in like the same factory over in Germany. And I really feel like that's true because I've tried so many drugstore eyeliners and lip liners that are amazing. They're so creamy and I really don't notice a whole lot of difference. Again, same thing with brow products. Um, by the way, this is the NYX Lift and Snatch Brow Pen in the shade Ash Brown. So I'm just gonna try to fill in my brows while I'm talking. I talked a while and now my brows are dry. Um, so yeah, I would say brow products are another one that I can pretty much find what I need at the drugstore. Another category I think you can safely buy at the drugstore are lipsticks because there are a lot of brands like Maybelline and L'Oreal that have just a really wide extensive range of lip products and shades. I would say the one exception to that is if you're cruelty free, a lot of the drugstore brands are not and the ones that are don't tend to have the biggest ranges when it comes to lip products. It's always the smaller drugstore brands like Essence and Catrice. I mean, I guess CoverGirl is one bigger one that's cruelty free, but unfortunately the brands that have the best shade ranges are usually not. So, um, but lipsticks, lip glosses, I think you can definitely find a ton of those at the drugstore. And again, I don't see much of a difference in formula between the high end and the cheaper options. Um, and then another one I would say you can totally buy at the drugstore is mascara. There are some really nice high end mascaras out there, but there are so many amazing ones at the drugstore that I rarely buy a high end mascara and and usually if I do, I buy the mini because I usually don't get through the whole tube anyway. And then the mini is kind of like a similar price to the drugstore anyway. So yeah, I would say those are the categories you can probably just save your money on. When it comes to, I would say complexion products, foundation, primer, you usually find a wider range in the high-end brands. Not saying that there aren't amazing options at the drugstore because a lot of my favorite foundations and concealers and primers are from the drugstore, but often the higher-end brands are gonna have wider shade ranges. It's often easier to find a color that you're looking for because the stores like Sephora have testers available or they'll give you samples. And at the drugstore, sometimes, you know, it's like you don't wanna necessarily chance that. And we're actually gonna talk about that a little bit later on in this video. Another category is eyeshadow. I think while there are some good eyeshadows at the drugstore, there aren't as many. And I think you often have to go into like the more affordable indie brands like ColourPop and Moira or Juvia's Place to be able to find like a really good solid eyeshadow formula. The bigger brands like L'Oreal and Maybelline and CoverGirl, like their eyeshadows still need a lot of work. So if you're talking about strictly drugstore, there aren't a lot of great options and I would just recommend investing in a higher end eyeshadow palette. It, unless of course you have access to ColourPop or some of the other indie brands that I mentioned because those are some of my absolute favorites when it comes to eyeshadow. Okay, so moving on to question number three, I actually got a lot of questions about primers. The first one is, I would love to know what you think the best primers are for the following separate needs, dry skin, pore filling and smoothing and longevity. Another one said, what is the best pore primer for mature women? And then a third one said, I use the L'Oreal primer in the pot that you like. How does the new one in the tube compare? Sorry, I'm not near my makeup right now. I'm not sure of the names, but hopefully you know what I mean. Yes, I definitely do. So just to answer that one really quickly, I still prefer the L'Oreal one in the pot. I know that it's being discontinued. It's getting harder to find online, especially. You can walk into the drugstore and still find it, but I think at this point, once it's gone, it's gone. It's truly the best pore smoothing primer I have ever used hands down. And I think that the new L'Oreal one in the tube doesn't compare. It's a little bit pore smoothing, but it doesn't give that same airbrushed look that the one in the jar does, unfortunately. Really, I have still not found a pore smoothing primer that I like better than that one. The Tarte Timeless Smoothing Primer is very close to the L'Oreal, but it's still not quite as smoothing, but it has the same kind of thicker putty-like texture. And I think that one is actually a good one for more mature skin types. Also, Winky Lux has a primer that is very similar to the L'Oreal. Again, it's not exact, but I think it's pretty close. Other than those, I would say my favorite pore smoothing primers are the Tatcha Liquid Silk Canvas, which I know is really expensive, but that one is the one that I would say comes probably the closest to the L'Oreal as far as pore smoothing. I just don't always recommend that one because it is like super pricey, but I think it's an amazing primer if you're looking to splurge on one. Also the Cali Ray So Blown Primer, that's a pretty good pore smoothing primer, and also it has some hydration in it if you have drier skin. And the Nick 
Mix Marshmallow Primer is another pretty good pore smoothing one at the drugstore. And then if you have like a more oily skin type or you want a primer that's a little bit thinner and has more of like a velvety texture, I would suggest the Benefit Porefessional. The only reason I don't use that one very often is just because it has a very dry feel and my skin is already really dry. So I know they make a hydrating one. I just don't find that that one is as good. And for a drugstore option, the NYX Pore Filler has that same kind of feel that the Porefessional has. So if you don't have super dry skin, those two are also really good pore smoothing options. So I guess I kind of took care of that category. Um, as far as hydrating primers go, I really like the Too Faced Plump and Prime. That one is like a hydrating serum and a primer in one, and it really does like plump up your skin and make it look really good. So I like that one a lot. The NYX Plump Right Back is more of a gel-like texture, but that one is very hydrating and it just gives your skin like a nice dewy glow. The YSL Too Chiclot Primer, again, this is kind of like my luxury splurge worthy primer. If you have dry skin, it's amazing. It has more of like an oil base to it. So it is so deeply nourishing for dry skin and it really helps your foundation to go on so smoothly. So I love that one. And actually one that's kind of similar to the YSL and it also has that more oil based feel to it is the Nabla Angel Aura. And this one has a little bit of a glow to it. Actually, I think I'm gonna use this one today. So this one is cheaper than the YSL. It's not a drugstore price, but it's kind of somewhere in the middle. So I would say those are probably my favorite hydrating primers. And then when it comes to long wearing, I feel like nothing beats the e.l.f. Power Grip Primer or the Milk Makeup Hydro Grip if you wanna go on the higher end side. Those just have such a sticky, tacky base and they really help to grip your makeup well. So I hope that answers your question about primers and gives you a few different options to check out. But yeah, this Nabla one, you can see like it just gives your skin this really nice glow and it has like an oily kind of feel. So it feels like you applied some skincare. It's really, really nice. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Question number four is what do you think is the future of makeup? Will sales continue on the high flying tear of the past decade or is the market approaching saturation and how will that play out? So that's really interesting. I do think about this sometimes, but I mean, there's no way to really know for sure. By the way, I'm just gonna be using the Hamish Moringa Ceramide BB Cream and I have the shade 23. I've been using this almost every day lately. It has SPF 30. But back to the question, I do think that there's always gonna be people who wear makeup. It's been going on for centuries and it's going to continue. So I don't think that people are necessarily gonna lose interest in makeup, but I do think that the trends can change. For example, we saw a swing towards more minimal makeup during the pandemic and more people were buying skincare than makeup. But I'm seeing that the trend start to shift back a little bit to the 2015, 2016 makeup now. I've seen a lot of liquid lipsticks coming out, the heavier warm tones and the eyeshadow palettes coming back. So I think there's always gonna be kind of ebbs and flows. We're gonna see times of like really fast growth and then it'll overcorrect. And then we'll kind of see a lull for a while when everybody kind of overdoes it and gets bored. And then I think naturally people are gonna start to crave buying makeup again after a while. I mean, a lot of people say like makeup is done Dying, the makeup community is dying. I don't see it. I mean, I do see definitely less interest on YouTube, but I think people who are watching YouTube are probably like millennial age and above. And we just went through that whole huge makeup boom. So I think some of us are just like, we've seen it all already. Not a lot impresses us anymore. Things that are new that are coming out are just reminding us of stuff that we already have. But there's a whole generation over on TikTok that hasn't been through it yet. And I didn't realize until I went on TikTok just how huge makeup is over there and they're selling out products left and right like the YouTubers were several years ago. So it's pretty much like the heyday of YouTube over there. It's just that a lot of us over here aren't watching that. So we don't really realize it's going on. But also as far as brands continuing to rapidly launch makeup at this pace that they've been going for a while, I think they will as long as there's a demand for it. And I think with the rise of social media, there's always gonna be that demand. When I was growing up, brands used to just release makeup a couple of times a year. They would release like a summer collection and then something in like the fall and winter. And the big brands would release like one eyeshadow palette for the entire year and you'd have all this time to play with it. But that was before social media when people could get on and talk about these things and hype people up and get them excited. So now that that's kind of here to stay, I don't necessarily see the brand slowing down 
as long as they don't have to. Question number five says, as a non-instant tanner, it would be awesome to see all of your favorite body bronzers. So I do have a couple of different options because um, I've mentioned in the past that I'm not crazy about using self tanner because I don't know if it's just because my skin is so dry, even if I exfoliate well, it still tends to grab and look patchy like around my knees and ankles and elbows. So I just have a hard time making self tanner look good, but I, kind of gravitated toward body bronzers that you just wear it, you know, for the day and then you wash it off. So there are two liquid ones that I really like, um, Vita Liberata's Body Blur. I got this on Amazon and I have mine in the shade Light. And I'm actually wearing this today on my body and it really just gives a subtle bronzed effect. It basically just feels like a body lotion, but it adds a little bit of color to your skin. And a slightly more affordable option is the Soul Body Bronzer from ColourPop. So this one I also have, no, this one's in the shade Fair. This one's light. Um, I feel like the ColourPop one is a little bit warmer looking. The Vita Liberata has more of that olivey undertone, so it doesn't look quite as warm and orangey. But even though the ColourPop one does look like that coming out of the tube. I feel like once you apply it and blend it into your skin, it looks really good and really natural. And I don't think it's super orange. I have shown a before and after here on this channel of my legs using the ColourPop one. And the difference is definitely huge. Like you can really get a nice tanned and bronzed look just for the day. And both of these are supposed to be waterproof. I've never jumped into a pool wearing them or anything, but once I apply them, I just wait a couple minutes, let it dry down, and then I get dressed and I haven't noticed them like rubbing off on my clothing, but I wouldn't suggest getting too, too wet if you're wearing those. And then I recently got a powder option that I really like, and this is from Tarte. It's the Park Avenue Princess body bronzer. So they do have the regular Park Avenue Princess. It's a smaller size. This one is meant for the body and it's also a waterproof powder. And I got this brush from Sephora Collection to apply it with. This is a body brush. So I just like to swirl the brush into the powder. And then like I can just demonstrate, I guess on my arm, I don't want to get it on my clothes, but I'll just quickly show you, like you just kind of buff it into the skin. This is obviously a little bit of a longer process than using a lotion like this. I think the lotion just goes quicker but this just gives you such a gorgeous glow. And I like using this kind of like on my shoulders, collarbone, like the fronts of your legs. Like if you just wanna add a little bit of bronze, now I feel like I'm gonna look uneven because that just added a lot more color. Um, but yeah, this is another really great option. It lasts the entire day. Like when I put this on, by the time I'm ready to go to bed, it still looks the same as when I put it on in the morning. So it's kind of like a thicker, more velvety powder that just really grips to your skin nicely. All right, I'm just gonna add a a little bit more. I just feel like I'm so uneven right now. All right, so moving on to question number six, what makeup brand will you not purchase from? So there's a couple. Um, the first one is She Glam, and I know that I did talk about She Glam in the past, but after the article came out about how they treat their workers and how some of them like go a month without a day off, a lot of them have to like just sleep in the factory. Um, I can link to the article down below, but I just felt like that was horrible. And I also just worry about the safety of the products. Same goes for Timu. I know a lot of people love Timu right now. I would personally worry about about the quality at least of something that I was gonna put on my body. Maybe if it were like a household product or something, I wouldn't worry as much. And then another brand that I've never purchased from and don't plan on it is Jeffree Star. I think for obvious reasons, he's just not somebody that I care to support. So those are three that I can think of off the top of my head. The next question says, have you stopped using Beauty Pie products even after the sponsorship? I still occasionally saw you mention their products, but I haven't seen any in a while. So um, I did do I think like two, one or two sponsored videos for them back when I was doing sponsorships. I don't do them anymore. But I initially started talking about Beauty Pie just because I read about it in a magazine or an online article and I thought it sounded cool. I actually purchased the membership myself. The sponsorship came later after I had already done several videos on them and then they had asked to sponsor a few as well. And I think the reason that I stopped
stopped. There's a couple of reasons. The first one is that I always got a lot of pushback from viewers when I would talk about Beauty Pie. A lot of people felt like they were a scam or it wasn't worth it. Um, some people even thought that they were like a shady company. I mean, they're not. They're run by the former owner of Bliss. So you guys know Bliss Skincare and the Bliss Spas in New York City and around the world. Her name's Marcia Kilgore. She also owns Soap and Glory as well. So it's not a shady company by any means, but they have this subscription model where you pay a certain price like for a yearly membership and then that gets you access to cheaper products and a lot of people just weren't crazy about that business model which I completely understand so whenever I would talk about beauty pie a I would get negative comments on the video I'd get a lot of like thumbs downs on the video uh, they just weren't getting the views that other videos were getting so it was one of those situations where I just felt like I have to read my audience and it just seemed like the majority of people were not interested in beauty pie and the other thing is, um, you know, they've kind of changed their business model a little bit. They've simplified things. They used to have all these different levels of membership. Now it's just you pay $59 a year or you can do a month to month with like a $10 a month option. So that part of it is better. But I've also noticed that they've raised their prices quite a bit. I just bought a whole bunch of things to use just like in my personal life. I wasn't really planning on talking about them on YouTube. And I was surprised at the prices going up. And I think that's because they lowered the cost of the membership to make it seem more accessible. But for example, I got this blush. This is like one of their cream blushes, but they have a luminous line now. So I thought this looked so pretty. And this was $15. And usually I felt like a blush or something like this would be closer to the $10 range. So they've definitely raised prices. I mean, honestly, everybody is. So it's not really a big surprise. But for me, the whole reason to subscribe to them and to pay the $59 a year was to get access to the super cheap prices and now they're just kind of priced like everybody else so I do still think the quality is amazing and I think with the skincare side of things you still get a really good deal because skincare even at the drugstore is really expensive I'm not ready to give it up just yet because there are like reoccurring purchases when it comes to skincare that I buy pretty often and I do love the whole experience of ordering from them it's insanely good like the products just look and feel so luxurious and they are like more on the drugstore side as far as pricing goes and that $59 a year works out to like $4.95 a month or like five bucks a month. So for me, it's not really a big deal. I think the products definitely feel like luxury. Actually, I figured I would use a couple of the things that I just got recently. They have a new cream bronzer that reminds me a lot of the Chanel one and I got it in the shade Goldilocks. So I figured maybe I'll use this and kind of bronze up my face a little to match my body. I'm just gonna apply it with the Profusion Buffing Foundation Brush. But yeah, I do think that their quality is amazing. Definitely worth it. I don't think that they're a scam or a shady company at all. According to their website, the products are made in like the same factories as high-end makeup in Italy and Switzerland. And I've honestly never had a bad experience with them. I've had maybe like one or two products flop the whole time. Most things are just super high quality and definitely worth the money for me. Like this bronzer right now, it's beautiful. It is melting into my skin. It's blending out like a dream. I actually like it more than the Chanel one. It doesn't have the strong floral scent that that one has. And I think I actually like the color of this one a little bit better. It's not quite as yellowy. And looking at their website right now, if you're a member, this is $19, which is a lot cheaper than the $50 price tag of the Chanel one. And then if you add in the $5 a month that I'm paying, it's like $24. So it's not inexpensive, but it's also a super luxurious product. The packaging looks and feels amazing and so high-end. It's not Chanel, but it's half the price and the experience is the same. So yeah, it's beautiful. That's why I continue to purchase from Beauty Pie. But again, if it's not your thing, I totally get it. And that's basically why I don't really talk about them on my channel. I think I'm also gonna try the new cream blush that I got from them. This is the shade Astro Pink. It's their super cheek cream blush and I love the original one so this one just has more luminosity to it it comes in a really nice heavy glass jar and this one is also made in Italy yeah look at how pretty this is it just gives the most beautiful glow a little bit of color and these just blend out so effortlessly they dry down to a powder finish so I love them let's just look at the next question do you change your makeup routine in the hotter months if so how 
So yes, I definitely do change up my routine. I would say in the summer, I wear less makeup and I'm definitely okay with that. In the summertime, I just spend a lot more time outside and what I would normally wear in the winter when I'm mainly indoors can look like way too much in the summertime when you're outside a lot and there, you know, the daylight is longer. There's a lot more daylight. Even if you're inside, there's a lot more light coming in through the windows and makeup in natural lighting versus like artificial lighting is just very, very different different. So I tend to use a lot less in the summertime, not to mention, I think the heat and humidity are just too much to keep up with. I don't really want to wear a full face of makeup. It just feels like too much and too heavy. I know a lot of people who try to like waterproof and sweat proof their makeup and, and that's not me. I have tried to do that in the past and maybe I just haven't found the right products, but inevitably I feel like if I wear a whole face full of makeup and then I go outside by the end of the day, everything is runny and smudgy and it just looks awful. So I just try to minimize that as much as I can. Usually for me, I'm just wearing a skin tint like I put on today, like the Hamish one. Maybe I'll wear a bronzer, but not always. I'll apply a blush, like usually a cream blush, like I just did. Generally for my eyes, I'll apply one color of eyeshadow, just like a one and done shade. And then I'll wear a tubing mascara that's not gonna smudge on me. And then a lip gloss or tinted balm. And that's basically it. So I really don't go too crazy. I use a lot of cream products versus powder because again, I feel like the cream products just kind of melt into your skin and powders can sometimes like break up or get patchy if the weather is humid. So I think creams just wear better in the humidity. So I just basically keep it really casual and I don't even set my face because honestly, having dry skin almost all year in the summertime, I kind of enjoy this little bit of dewiness. So I just kind of go with it. So to answer your question, in the summertime, my routine gets way simpler way easier and I'm just kind of happy with wearing less makeup, I guess. The next question I actually got quite a few different variations of. The first one says, what strategies do you use to find your best foundation match online? I know that can be really, really difficult. The next one says, I'm curious about your views on the greatly expanded shade range of foundations. I wholly support companies providing shades for a broad range of skin tones from light to dark, but I also see so many videos where people have a hard time finding a good match. Having 50 to choose from, seems to make it more difficult. It seems like a marketing tool as the number of shades keeps growing. And then the third one that I saw said, what is the best way to pick a foundation and a lipstick without a tester, either in store or online? So I know it's definitely not an easy task when you're trying to shop online or in a drugstore where there are no testers. And I mean, some brands make it easier. They put like a C or a W or an N for like cool, warm and neutral when it comes to foundations and concealers. Um, I think honestly, they all should do that. But then again, I have purchased foundations that had that little C for cool and I got it home and it was still very yellow looking on me. So you can't always go by those either. And to be honest, I don't even know if I'm the right person to be answering this question because I still, to this day, after buying foundation for most of my life, end up with wrong shade matches all the time. I've learn to not be as picky about it. And I think part of that is because I don't wear full coverage foundation. Like in the past, when I used to wear my foundation like a mask, it had to match because otherwise there was a very clear demarcation line. But these days I'm wearing things that are a lot more sheer and just sheer out enough that you don't always notice much of a difference if the color isn't a spot on perfect match. I think this is kind of like where I was talking in the beginning about shopping higher end brands when it comes to complexion products because they generally have more swatches and photos on the website. Like if you go to the Sephora website and you look for a foundation, generally they'll have a ton of arm swatches and you can kind of look at which one has an undertone similar to yours. Or a lot of times they'll show all different models wearing each color. And in that case, I'll kind of choose the shade where the model skin tone looks the most similar to mine. But yeah, it's not always easy, especially for those of us who have a pink undertone or an olive undertone because I do think that most foundations out on the market are yellow and it's just kind of the way that it's always been. When I worked at Sephora, we went through all of this training and I believe one of the statistics they said was that like 80% of people have a yellow undertone and that's why most foundations are like that. But I think to answer the question like about the shade ranges, I almost feel like they would be better served to not have as many shades, but just to focus more on 
undertones because I've heard this even from friends of mine who have deeper skin tones that just having the extra deeper skin tone options like it's great but a lot of times the undertone isn't right and it's definitely the same on the lighter end of the spectrum too because those of us with pink and olive undertones often have a really hard time finding a color match. They should really focus on like educating people about finding their undertone and focus on providing a wider range of the undertones rather than just the color itself. Because I find that a lot of times there are several foundations in a, like within a range that look like they're almost the same color. And it's like, why bother at that point? Just make them kind of like the same color, but with a different undertone. And that would work out so much better. All right, I have to get going on my eyes. I've been talking and not doing my makeup. So I think for today, this is what I've been doing in the summer. I've been using just like a one and done shadow, like I mentioned. So today I'm going to be using the ColourPop Jelly Much eyeshadow. And this is in the shade Shiny Penny. This is like one of my favorites. I wear this one so often and I love the Jelly Much shadows. They have a really cool creamy gel texture and they just look amazing on the eyes. They last all day. So I really like these a lot. I have a ton of different colors and I'm reaching for them constantly. Um, so the next question says, why when I use a heavy duty face cream, does it cover the surface dryness, but not actually sink in and the flaky skin still reemerges later? So it's funny that you mentioned this because I literally just posted a skincare video last week talking about this exact thing. So I always used to wonder the same thing. I would use these really thick moisturizers and then my skin would be dry and flaky again throughout the day. And I'm gonna go ahead and link my skincare video down below because I go more in depth with this in that video. So definitely check it out if you're interested. But my secret for getting dry skin to stay hydrated throughout the day is to apply a whole bunch of really light layers instead of just one heavy layer. So I like to take a super hydrating toner and I put a little bit like in my hands, mix it together, pat it onto my face like that. And then I let it sink in. And then I go back in and apply another layer of the toner and let that sink in. And in that video, I shared an analogy of like a plant. So think of your skin like as the dirt in the plant. If you pour water in, you let the water sink into the dirt, it's still not saturated. So then you pour a little more water until the water is coming out the bottom. And then you know that all of the soil is saturated. And I do the exact same thing with my skin. I just apply usually like three, sometimes four layers of toner. And I just kind of let it dry a little bit in between, then add another one. And once my skin feels like it's really like full of moisture and plump, then I'll move on and add a serum. Then I'll add my moisturizer on top of that. And all of those layers kind of just lock everything into place, keep you moisturized all day. Because especially if you live in more of a dry environment, your skincare is just constantly evaporating. And if you just have one layer sitting on top, it's going to evaporate and disappear and then your skin is going to get dry again. So you really want to make sure that you are fully saturating your skin all the way and the hydration will last a lot longer. But like I said, I go into like the products I use and all of that in that video. So I'll link that down below. The next question actually, as we're about to talk about mascara, would you please rank the tubing mascaras that you've tried in order of preference? I'm still looking for an affordable holy grail mascara and I trust your judgment. Okay, so I know not everybody is gonna agree with me with my number one choice, but it's this one, the Milani Highly Rated Lash Extension Tubing Mascara and the Thrive Cosmetics Liquid Lash Extensions is also in my number one spot. And these to me are identical. I know I got a lot of pushback when I did a dupes video about this, people saying that they didn't feel like they were the same. I mean, if you look at the ingredient list, like they have almost the identical ingredients in the same order and they have the same brush. Like when I use these two, I don't notice the difference. I did think that the Milani one is maybe just a little bit goopier and more prone to clumping. So I would just suggest wiping off your brush beforehand and get rid of some of the excess mascara and you'll be good. But I just feel like this gives me the longest lashes out of any tubing mascara and it definitely removes the easiest. 
Then I would say in my number two spot is probably the Tarte Tartlet Tubing Mascara and maybe the LA Colors Biggie Lash. I like those about the same, but also I feel like they don't act like a tubing formula when it comes to removal. Both of those don't come off quite as easily as the Milani or the Thrive one. And I've also had some smudging with those as well when I go to remove them. And then like if I dry my eyes on a towel, I'll see like some mascara smudges, which I definitely don't see see with the Milani or the Thrive. But I would say as far as the way my lashes look, I like those two probably next. Then after that, I would probably say the Cali Ray Come Hell or High Water is a really good one as well. I don't think it gives me as big of lashes as the Milani or the Thrive, but it's a really nice tubing formula and I think it removes easily. After that, I would say probably the L'Oreal Double Extend. That one is also a really good option at the drugstore. It's a classic, it's been around a really long time and that one gives me pretty good length and volume. After that one, I would say the Hamish Mascara. I know so many people love that one and I've heard so many good things, so I ended up trying it out and I love the way it made my lashes look, but it started to kind of flake into my eyes. Like the tubes were coming off prematurely even though I wasn't washing my face and they were going into my eyes and getting stuck in my contacts and I just could not wear that one because of all the flaking that was happening. I don't know if I just got a bad tube or one that was dried out, but I just really wasn't a fan of that one. And then at the bottom, I would say like the number seven tubing mascara and the Essence Bye Bye Panda Eyes. They were okay as far as removal, like they're definitely tubing formulas, but I just didn't feel like they did anything for my lashes. They didn't give me as much length and volume as I wanted. They just gave like a very natural look, which if that's what you're into, those are really good options. But if you like more of that false lash look and like tons of length and volume, those were just like, they kind of made my lashes look more wimpy. So those two were definitely at the bottom of my list. I don't know if I missed any, if I did, please let me know down in the comments and I can kind of tell you where it ranks in between, but I think that's all of the tubing mascaras I've tried. I'm not positive. Okay, so then for lips, I think I'm gonna use the NYX Fat Oil in the shade Follow Back. This is just like a light nude color and I've been wearing these so, so much lately. So let's do one more question. This one says, what is your number one favorite eyeshadow palette? And then underneath it says to add on to that, I would be interested in hearing a favorite high-end eyeshadow palette and a favorite drugstore palette. And I also had another question that asked if I still like the Tartlet in Bloom as my number one or if that's changed as well. So I would say yes, that probably has changed. I do still like the Tartlet in Bloom, but I don't reach for it as much as some other ones that I've gotten more recently. So I would say on the drugstore or more affordable side, my favorite palette probably is Stone Cold Fox from ColourPop. You guys knew I was gonna say that, right? Um, either Stone Cold Fox or Smoke and Roses. I use these two pretty interchangeably. They just have every color that I would ever want or need, basically. Um, and Stone Cold Fox, like it's super neutral. So this is just the one that I, you know, reach for on a daily basis. It's mostly cool tone shadows, which is what I'm mostly into. But you do have some warmer options, a couple of rosy tones in here as well. And then Smoke and Roses just kind of expands on the rosy tones a little bit more. And this one has a mix of, again, both warm and cool tones, but it's very neutral for the most part. But yeah, I would say these are probably my favorite favorite on the drugstore side. And then as far as my favorite high-end eyeshadow palettes go, again, I have to choose something neutral because those are the ones I'm reaching for the most. And I would have to say the Doll Squad 1 and 2 from Doll 10. The Doll Squad 1 is probably my favorite just because it has, again, those cooler tones in it that I like to reach for. It does have a few warm tones as well. And then the 2.0 version is all warm toned, but it, again, beautiful. Just the most amazing blendable formula. The shimmers are those really gorgeous like metallic foils that aren't super glittery. And this is a talc-free formula. The mattes are just velvety. They glide across your eyelids so easily. And these are just a joy to work with, honestly. So these would definitely be my favorite, the number one and then the number two. But I have to say for honorable mention, probably the Huda Beauty Naughty Nudes palette. I really, really love that one too. It has these gorgeous rosy tones and I love her formula. I think it's just, again, very easy to work with. And that palette just has such a beautiful range of shades. And every time I use it, I love the way my makeup comes out. So yeah, I would say those are my favorite eyeshadow palettes. So anyway, guys, 
Thank you so much for sitting down and watching this video. I truly appreciate it so much. And if you like the style of me answering questions, I do have a couple of other ones that I've done in the past. So I will link that playlist right here for you to check out next. If you have any answers to the questions that we heard today and you want to leave your thoughts down below, definitely help us out. Let us know and be sure to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and I'll see you all in my next one. Take care guys. Bye.